So Volker Treffers, a very famous, a prominent architect and an urban planner from the Netherlands that since 2015 become quite famous in Ukraine. He started with the strategic vision for Mariupol city. Since 2016, he joined the Harkiv School of Architecture and he has been yeah, there ever since. Uh, he worked on multiple projects in cities like Zhytomyr, Kiev, Solidar, Severodonetsk. And he also did some advisory work for Lysychansk, Zaporizhzhia, Kravyri, and, and some other cities and towns. Uh, he fell in love with Ukraine so much that just before the war started, he was actually thinking of buying an apartment in Kharkiv. Look, I hope it wasn't a big secret. Um, and what makes it even more special, he is one of the co-founders of Roskrit. So, Fulko, thank you so, so very much for joining today's lecture. Before we go into the lecture itself, please do tell us a few words about Roskrit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentina, for these uh, very kind words. Um, it's uh, I'm always almost getting a little bit silent because of this, uh, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, unfortunately, I have to do it alone today. Uh, but uh, um, well, we are with a, with an audience that can help me, and that we can discuss and communicate. Like Valentina said, please raise your hand, and we'll make it an interactive discussion as well. The lecture is going to be about uh, the role of urban design, and um, I've got it pretty much um, uh, in five blocks uh, prepared. Uh, first, uh, an intro uh, about the Roskvit and about urban planning in Ukraine. Then, um, some information about urban planning laws in Ukraine at this moment. Third, the Roskvit urban planning projects that we are having at this moment as pilot projects and uh, then uh, finalizing with some inspirational examples and a discussion together with you. So here we start. Um, to, to refresh for some of you, and maybe for some of you it's the first time, Bosfeed is, uh, is founded just uh, in March in 2022. So probably around six months ago. And, uh, um, uh, it was a, a network of people around the Kharkiv School of Architecture that came together and after a few, uh, a few meetings by just talking and expressing our feelings and our maybe also anger and, and, uh, and uh, our stress, we also thought we have something to, to say about the reconstruction of Ukraine. That's what we are good at. That's maybe what we understand. Um, and uh, we decided to become some kind of a network organization that we called Roskvit. And we um, defined our goals and, and redefined them last summer. And uh, here they are in this picture. To improve the quality of living in Ukraine, to do that by making methodologies for um, uh, changes, transformation and urban planning and architecture in, in Ukraine to do it by using integrated layers and, uh, uh, in, in the design process and to have the citizens involved in all processes. And second goal is to be really prepared when the war ends, even, of course, sooner the, the sooner the better, but in, uh, in this case, we know that this rethinking and advisory, it takes a lot of time to discuss, to find out, to uh, deliberate, to set the agenda, to build up the capacities and to relate to more EU standards that we are facing. At. And as a network, we decided we are not going to do this as like a, a hierarchy organization. We are going to uh, work together uh, as, a, as a group of people who do this according to values. And the five values that are since the beginning, actually the first few weeks of our organization were uh, on top of the list were these five. It's about people, it's a social value. It's, it's people first. It's about a network to develop within Ukraine and beyond. It's about transparency and ethical uh, issues. It's good governance. And it's about 
the future of our generation, the future generations. So we need to have everything climate proof and durable, sustainable, resilient. And it's about education, capacity building, learning, providing continuity for also next decades. And we started with a few people and then by now it's, uh, uh, I think a little bit over 80 or 85 people. Uh, and uh, we are having an organization which is Ukrainian based. So we are primarily a Ukrainian organization. And um, uh, as, a, as a principle, we said minimum of our team is Ukrainian, the minimum 50%. And this is important because uh, in all our discussions we experience that it's really clear that the Ukrainians have uh, so much um, information about their own country, so much knowledge about their own country, so, so much knowledge about everything that needs to be developed uh, uh, and uh, can be developed also. And this, um, uh, this means we are definitely not trying to be some kind of external organization that would think or even uh, consider to think that uh, we know it all for Ukraine, which is definitely not the case. We have to do it together. Um, um, we can support as a foreigners. We are not the developers, we are not investors, we are not builders, but we are researchers, designers, policy advisors, maybe teachers, and these are the topics that we're into. So not just a physical thing, not just the hardware, but it's also about legal issues. It's also about energy. It's also about mobility and transport, economy, ecology, cultural landscape. So it's the whole wide picture which has to be taken into account when you're doing urban strategies or urban planning or urban design. And a very difficult fact in, in, in this country at this moment is we are constantly in a time squeeze. Uh, I explain to people very often it's like stepping into a time machine when you're thinking about Ukrainian redevelopment and reconstruction. You don't know when the peace comes and where it comes and for how long, how long it stays. Uh, but uh, and you, so you don't know for what planning you are, are are preparing. But we do know that there is a constant link between that what we are going to do right now for urgent needs right now and for the long term improvements in decades to be done. And this is also what we uh, have seen in other post-war uh, cities in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, all around the world, actually, that when you don't combine these uh, short-term and long-term uh, developments in your head, in your strategy, in your design, if you don't connect these, then there's a, a huge risk of being stuck with um, uh, those uh, buildings that were thought of being temporary and then they stayed for, for, for years and years and years and uh, in that way uh, the lack of quality could be in your city available. And we are constantly saying to all the governments uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in all around the world so this is the, the picture that we're having. There's a huge amount of costs every piece comes and everybody's talking about billions and billions of, of, of euros and dollars. Um, uh, but uh, let's try to make, to be prepared and to make the budget as also as smart as possible. If we can now uh, organize already the rethinking and the preparing, then hopefully we can reduce time and costs for the rebuilding process itself. So this is what we do as an OSCFIT. We do research, we do action projects, and we do education. And we'll see a little bit later on, uh, on this. And these are, of course, overlapping. And the interesting thing for us is to, to look at this overlap. This is probably what OSCFIT is about, where we can have our, our uh, most added value. And then, by doing this, uh, in these researches, uh, action projects and educational projects, we get a better and better understanding of what it means to have uh, planning in Ukraine at this moment or after the war, and also have a better understanding of what post-war urban planning actually means, because that is a specific element which needs to be taken into account. And then we develop those methodologies and guidebooks for all around the country, uh, for all um, cities, romadas, for all oblasts, to um, uh, to be able to work themselves with maybe checklists, maybe um, some 
um, uh, some books that could help you develop uh, your own uh, city strategy or your own urban plans uh, according some new um, uh, useful guides. And we also will uh, develop a network of experts from Ukraine and abroad, which have the capacity, capacity to support all those developments or many of those developments in the future. So that is what we are aiming to do between now and next year, probably. We divided our programs in five different topics. You have, here you can see an overview of those five topics. It's about architecture and housing with specific uh, uh, projects in, uh, in detail uh, that are there. Some research and housing projects, IDPs. Uh, we have resources and infrastructure, which is all about mobility and energy and, and uh, circular building. We've got socioeconomic program about uh, the memory, about the culture, about uh, what heritage means in, uh, in uh, what public space means. And we've got a capacity building program for all those future generations and existing uh, civil servants in Ukraine right now. And uh, the fifth one, and that is mainly what we are talking about today, is about urban planning. Although I'm really anxious to tell you all about the other four programs, we have to stick to that part. And we'll we, do another lecture, uh, full paper. We have other lectures <laughs> indeed for uh, for those uh, those other elements. Okay, um, let's see what we have at this moment uh, in in Ukraine. And um, actually, I was uh, explained by this. Uh, um, in a lecture of a few hours and I tried to do it in four slides or something to, to explain what the urban planning laws are at this moment in, in Ukraine. So we've got three different levels of uh, planning schemes that, uh, that are uh, in Ukraine uh, needed for uh, different governments. So we've got the national level where it's a general scheme, regional level, uh, local level where they have several different um, uh, tools that, that guides uh, the urban planning in the city. And since uh, the beginning of June of this year, there was um, an, if two new laws uh, entered and that has to be done with somehow fast rebuilding, fast procedures because of the war and the necessities for that. I'll, I'll just skip through them uh, one by one uh, very briefly, but then we have a, a, a mutual understanding of what's happening. So this national level, the general scheme of the territory of Ukraine, um, it looks pretty much like this. You have the picture, it's like one picture of the whole country and on this picture there's different um, uh, legendas where you can see, okay, this is about the development of the, of the mobility, this is the development of nature, this is how the, where the cities are located. But there's a few buts, there's a few disadvantages about this general scheme because it's, for example, never been renewed since 2010 and there's no conceptual solution at a national level, which means that if you want to have a strategic new, uh, give a, a strategic new element inside this, uh, these maps, it's not being done yet. And also, which is not very handy, there is no digital format of this. So it's really a general, general scheme. It's not bad, but it's also not really helping out in making strategic uh, discussions and debates, and it doesn't bring so much there. Pretty much the same is a little bit about uh, the regional level. It, you see similar maps where you can see the streets, you can live the, 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 the main highways, you can see the river, for, in this case, for the, the, the Oblast of Kiev, and you can see the nature, some other uh, layers, of course, but it is not very precise because there's no digital format for this. There is no conceptual solution also on this level, so it doesn't give strategy to the future where you say, okay, but this is the way we're going to develop our region to. These are the projects or these are the topics that we really are changing in the next future. And also what we uh, experience is that there's hardly any collaboration between municipalities on defining this scheme. So there is uh, this level of the, of the oblast, but it's, it, it doesn't really have 
uh, for those um, smaller commands. And then on uh, the local level, uh, there's four different um, um, documents uh, which need to be prepared by the local government. It's a complex plan or a general scheme or zoning plans or detailed plans. And they have a little bit different skills. It's from a very small block to a, to a neighborhood uh, or to the whole city. And what one of the main uh, problems is here is that there's uh, so many different romadas um, 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 almost one and a half thousand, but there's not enough capacity to make these. And there's in many romadas a lack of strategic planning and a lack of vision, unfortunately. But it's it's um, it's not impossible with these with these documents. But yeah, the the, the communities are not the romadas are not really used to do this, and very often don't have the people in the municipality to bring this to another level. There's no integrated urban design layers. It is a, a pity. So you see di different layers, but when the integration comes and the mutual plus or the conflict could come, you won't see it, you don't feel it. And there is a focus on functional zoning, zoning only, which means that in many cases, uh, in many cities, there is nothing being said about density or about height or about guidelines for design or whatever. And that makes all together without the cadaster, without digital information, it's very often not so clear information from the investors. It makes it like a tool, which is also, um, um, it, it could be used much, much uh, more interesting, much more wise, but it, it doesn't come that far in it very often. I mean, this is a general response. I mean, there is cities and there is towns where it is better, but in many cases, it's uh, no, it's it's uh, it's not developed that far. And then uh, new in uh, 2022 was a rebuilding program and scheme of placement of temporary living. That means that the laws um, uh, provide a possibility for the city council or the mayor to have um, uh, a quick, fast rebuilding program and a place for uh, IDP houses or temporary living, and to be more precise, where there is no urban planning uh, documents required and there is less or no communication required with the citizens. And this is subject to the lobby of developers. I mean, we understand where it is, this, um, uh, this law comes from, of course. I mean, there are early topics, there are issues that need to be solved really fast, but, there is uh, there is also um, a backside of it, which is well at least something to be aware of. So in general, we see hardly any exchange um, in these laws and and by the production of these do documents between the different levels uh, on a country scale to a city scale. Also, we see hardly any exchange between the name of neighboring Romadas. There's a lack of broad knowledge about integrated urban design and also about effects of urgent housing or other post-war uh, issues, which we totally understand, but it's just to be clear that this is there. And it's um, what I also see is that, that there is a, a many openness for new visions and new methodologies in urban planning inside the country. And there is a time for rethinking and for learning right now. And there's a challenge to make a common understanding of the path to take together, together with cities, with the activists, with the citizens, with whatever community of professional architects. But this is a, a new language, language or understanding that we need to develop. Then, Roskvit has um, uh, a few urban planning pilot projects which uh, uh, which we um, agreed on with uh, a couple of cities and regions in Ukraine. And like I mentioned, uh, Roskvit didn't exist before the beginning of March, but uh, um, uh, yeah, our members, of course, do have uh, uh, connections. They did qu get questions and we said, okay, if we do it together, we can have all our knowledge, all our capacity, we can bring into one group according to these values and we try to work together as good as possible. And 
These are the uh, urban pilot projects, which are at this moment clear that we are working on uh, with different teams of urban planners. And um, um, personally, for me, the most uh, um, emotional one is Mariupol, not only because how it looks right now and how it was damaged and how it, about the destruction, but also because this was the first city that I really worked on and I, uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. And I have huge, uh, uh, enormous, brilliant memories about that uh, that time. Um, and uh, uh, we are one of the teams that have been asked to make a new strategy for the future of Mariupol, which is not like a detailed plan. It's not like everything we will know. At this moment, we are very humble. We are very in the beginning stage of trying to find the good decision, the the, the good discussions about. What does memory really mean? What is does it mean to come back when you live there, to come back to a country, that, to, to a city that has been so much um, damaged? One of the most famous cities on earth at this moment, uh, which probably also will attract a lot of people who just want to be there and look there and see what's really happening, but you're just living there and how can you uh, adjust to the new situation? Are you going to make something totally new? Are you going to do something in between where you, the memory is still there? Well, that is where also our researchers from other post-war situations are helping. Um, there is also uh, Zaporizhia. Zaporizhia is um, uh, uh, an eastern city, um, which is uh, also an industrial city. And uh, I've worked a lot in uh, industrial areas in the Netherlands. and. Um, mainly in Eindhoven, and it's very comparable to the situation which we had like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, where the industry was getting lower and lower and the pollution was still there. And Zaporizhia city asked us, how can we um, deal with the fact that we are so close to the front line, but we do want to develop, we do want to be uh, an open, welcoming city. We do think that our city is uh, has, a, has a, a bright future, it also had a bright history, and uh, how to uh, develop now in, this, in these times. It's, really, it's, it's uh, very really much related to the Dnipro River. It's um, uh, more than many of the uh, Ukrainian cities I know, it really touches the river uh, uh, all around, and that is uh, something very special. So the connection between nature and city is actually so big, that you, at a certain moment, don't even experience the huge pollution, which is also there anymore because of the beauty of the surroundings. <clears throat> um, interesting I, uh, about this region is that we also have a, a project with Zaporizhia Oblast, and Zaporizhia Oblast is is a very difficult, of course, because this is all um, for, for seventy five or eighty percent. It's now occupied by Russia, and this is a. Uh, um, at this moment, uh, even difficult to get maps. It's difficult to get the information, the data, because it's all classified information, which I totally understand. But how to work as an urban planner when you don't have maps? This is something totally new, and it's how to how we um, <coughs> how we are uh, trying to uh, develop ourselves. And of course, there's Google Maps, but that is not all. We need more data. We need more information. Um, what is happening in Zaporizhia is a, is a difficult topic about um, not knowing how they will uh, see the, the region, especially the smaller villages coming out of the war again. We know um, that there is a lot of damage done and we also wonder, and, and the question about uh, from the regional uh, architects was also how to um, discuss the topic of what to rebuild and what not and what to revive in, in terms of economy and what not. What do you invest in and what is future proof? And this is a, 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 a well, of course, a, 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 a very complex uh, topic. We are now waiting for the, for, the, for the best data to come. And in the meanwhile, we are doing small studies on this project, but not too deep yet. Okay, if I may ask, I think it might be interesting for the broader audience to know as well. Um, when you talk, let's take Mariupol, Zaporizhia, Zaporizhia Oblast, who are 
the people that are coming to Roskvit for the support, government, like what, what level of the government, what level of uh, credit, not credibility, but yeah, potential it's, investment. Uh, in this case, um, uh, all the organizations that I mentioned here, they, we, we talk with the uh, uh, deputy mayors and city councils and uh, they connect uh, the, um, with the with the mayor and uh, in um, all these regions and um, cities we have an official official um, question asked by those um, city councils and deputy mayors. Interesting enough, for example, Mariupol, it's a city council which are all around the world actually. Yeah. In, so they part of them lives and works from Zaporizhia, part of them live and work. From abroad or in Dnipro, and it still functions. It's it's a, a, a it's a good question because I I don't even notice it anymore. But the first meetings in 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 let's say in May or in June, it was very well, crazy or interesting. I don't know uh, both. how to call <laughs> it. Both uh, to see how resilient and how powerful these teams were, and how they were still working on. Uh, the city they, they 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 believe in and they dream of, uh, even though it's far away, and even though yeah they just maybe fled the, the, the city uh, a few weeks ago. And at this moment, uh, I, uh, as a team, we didn't go visit these areas. Uh, also, not Zaporizhia city, which would be possible. But uh, Rivna, Kiev, Oblast, Bucha, we did, and uh, we are. Uh, thinking of how to yeah, maybe uh, visit also uh, uh, other cities more into, into the east, depending on the well, military situation, of course. Thank you. Uh, Rivne is in northwest of uh, Ukraine, for those of you who don't know it. And this is a, a, a quite a difficult, a difficult, a different situation. This is a city which is pretty much a forgotten area for, for, for many people. It's not, not that many people go there. It's not a special attraction. Um, but it's quite close to Belarus. They are feeling the danger uh, uh, and, they are, uh, and the urgency uh, to doing something constantly. And on the one hand, they are attracting a lot of IDPs, the internally displaced uh, people, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, um, uh, but to give this a safe uh, environment and to give this also a functioning environment in terms of jobs or education or housing, well, this is typically the kind of city that has many, many indirect uh, uh, effects from uh, the war which is going on. Kiev Oblast is a uh, uh, beginning stage. Um, uh, trying to, to define the, the, the question that we are now trying to answer. It, it, it's indeed quite clear that, of course, in, in oblasts like Kiev, it's close to Belarus. It's a capital, which is also uh, uh, is so much bigger than every, every village around it. So everybody is depending on the capital, but also the other way around. They are also trying to wait to, to be different than the capital of uh, itself is. What are the regional uh, discussions to be, to be made together? Um, that is uh, that is now in the uh, in first stage of discussion. And for Bucha, it, uh, uh, we are a little bit further and we are now um, trying to define, to, to, to make um, uh, an, a new identity for the city because uh, as they say, we are just like a residential area as a, uh, uh, just outside of Kiev or, or as, a, as a neighborhood of Kiev. And we want to be stronger ourselves, more independent, more clear on what we are, what we are aiming ourselves. And this also reflects many choices we have to make in urban planning during the war and right away after the war as well. And um, a few things to say about those project teams that we have, we have uh, in any in any team, uh, the majority is Ukrainian team members. I think in all of the teams, it's like uh, 75 or 80%. Uh, hopefully, many of us have a personal relation with the place we're working for. It's not always possible, but it's the same when I work in the Netherlands. It's also not always possible, but it makes it stronger. We try to have uh, side visits uh, as, as uh, 
as much as possible. And we are a team of both researchers and designers. And then we have the full back off and feedback from the, the Buzzfeed Coalition. Here, you can see them on the map, Rivne, Bucha, Kirovla, Saporizhia, Mariupol. And then you can also see it's on purpose that we are looking at cities which are in a different state of relationship with the war. So we, we defined four different categories of cities, and we hope that out of those four categories, there will be some kind of general recommendations or, or things that we can put in these guidebooks to, um, to develop uh, later after the war, or maybe already now. So these are occupied cities like Mariupol or Shevardonetsk, um, uh, where I also worked a lot of times. Uh, it's also cities near the front line, like um, uh, or in the front line, which is uh, um, uh, uh, like Zaporizhia. Maybe it's in the front line. Uh, cities near the front line could be something like Kyivrich uh, or Kharkiv. Um, Kharkiv is maybe also in the front line, uh, and then. Um, cities in other parts of the country, I should say, and that means um, in this uh, in these different categories, we probably will find different main topics to address related to urgent housing, related to damages of infrastructure, related to um, um, uh, nature, related to I don't know exactly. That's what we're now finding out. But we think to, to categorize uh, the cities into these uh, cities, we hope we can find a, a way to advise other cities easier as well. So this is uh, this is what we are having. I actually just uh, pretty much said what uh, what was uh, happening here uh, in those different cities. So Mariupol, Zaporizhia city, Zaporizhia oblast, and Rivna. I already explained, and we are. In meetings every uh, every few weeks uh, with the different city councils or deputy mayors to uh, to to develop uh, our own knowledge better. To uh, and on the other hand, also that this the thinking about the future of their own cities, how hard it sometimes is, also for them that it, it becomes more uh, easy and more in their own agenda as well. But. The, those questions that are asked uh, to us, um, it's not always um, the most urgent or the most important question, the most important task. So, and actually this is the same in, in every project all around the world and, or, or in the Netherlands. Um, I always ask myself uh, before starting really what, what I'm gonna do, uh, and I take time for that and discuss it with the, with the client, or with, in this case, with the deputy mayor or the city council, what is actually the most important question? What, what should we solve? Uh, and not only the most urgent now, but the most important question for all those values that we are having, all those future uh, visions that we are looking for. And this is also um, what, um, yeah, what could be, um, experience by now after a few months uh, I really don't want to step back into my experience from 2021 and earlier but the, the experience we're having now uh, this is what we are finding out and this is what is the context of those tasks we are having so what we see is there's a huge resilience of local cities I mean I'm amazed also with 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 the the deputy mayor of Nikolaev, which we didn't even put in this list, but he, how, how, how he is trying to think about architecture and urban planning in a city uh, over there. And maybe all of you have seen this, these uh, videos of the theater that they built underground, because he is thinking about architecture underground. And you know, that kind of example is for me uh, a huge resilience, uh, uh, which I experience all around. Maybe there's not enough time, maybe there's not enough uh, capacity or knowledge of, of all the questions that are coming. It's impossible to have that, uh, but at least there is this willingness and there is this power and resilience to do it. Also, I experienced up to now that cities are very people-oriented. They are not just looking for buildings and parks and, and whatever and, and 
streets. It's, it's, it's really care for their citizens and look at it from that perspective. And that is actually not always how I experienced it the last few years. Uh, and that is a maybe new, maybe it's coincidence, or maybe it is what uh, one of the small advantages that we can think of what this war has brought us, that we are coming closer as people in Ukraine to each other. But we also experience that there's another brain drain going on. The brain drain, so the people uh, with high capacities, with a good overview, a high education, who left in, uh, the country in the 90s, there were many of them, many, many of them. Well, there is a new generation now which is just building up uh, uh, and, and taking responsibility right now. And this generation of all those people between, let's say, 20 and, and 35 or 40, many of them left. And I know also, uh, even in this room, some people went back. But when I look at the data, more people are going out than in still every day. And this is something we have to take into account. We cannot avoid it. It means something for our planning strategies. It means something for our way of working. Uh, not easier. There's also in many uh, cities a very double feeling about talking about reconstruction. Uh, can we talk about this uh, while the war is still on? Well, while our sons or daughters or families or whatever friends are at the front line uh, with a gun in their hand. They are, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very normal uh, double feeling. Uh, and we experience in Roskrit ourselves every day. We talk about it and still we think we should proceed with preparing the reconstruction. That is what we can do and what we can provide. Even though it's sometimes for some people not appropriate. There's also different uh, different experience in, in urban planning questions in different cities, and that many things do not have to do with these categories, but also it has to do a lot with the culture of the city itself. So thinking about guidebooks and methodologies, it's going to be quite hard to prepare them, but this is where we still need to figure out um, uh, in the next few months. And there's big differences in attitude. And it's the easiest way to explain. I see uh, cities who have a very pragmatic view, very pragmatic decisions, still with care for the citizens, still with resilience, but it's it's that 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 and they make. There is also those cities who are more visionary, who's, who who start from what do we really want, what do we really need, who are we actually, and where do we want to go? And this is also. Um, uh, very interesting to see two total different ways how to deal with the situation right now. I'm not sure what that actually means for our methodologies. I'm not sure what it means for uh, what we are going to deliver, but it's at least interesting to see. And last but not least, uh, we experience that uh, many of the people see a very limited role, a narrow role for urban designers or architects. And we have to change that, uh, that opinion, actually, I think, because we are not the ones who are only making the nice pictures or the nice maquettes or models. We are the ones who can integrate all those different uh, necessities, all those different ambitions. And that is so much more than the drawing and the, the creative part. It's also about the legal parts. It's also about processes. It's also about identity and social issues. So uh, the understanding of what we could provide is, uh, uh, well, at least somehow limited up till now. And those pilot projects might also help in bringing a new understanding on this experience. And then um, what we see now is uh, as, as a main task, main questions. So we re constantly redefining the questions that we're getting and redefining the questions that we're having for the strategic visions could be these strategic vision for a city or region, integrated design, all those different layers from mobility to nature, from energy to uh, uh, functions. Um, uh, we, uh, we will need to integrate them urgent needs versus long-term plan, 
the winter is coming, the climate change and building resources, the dependency of Russian gas, um, uh, regional collaboration. I talked about it before. How, how do Colomadas collaborate um, uh, with each other? How to set up a good professional urban design process? How to use the power of these citizens, their engagement? How to use it in the right way instead of a frustrating way? Um, and the knowledge, knowledge about capacity of local government uh, within the local government about post-war urban planning. It's, it's very typical knowledge, which is, of course, not present. So it's, it's all those questions we have to answer. The same about new economy and post-industrial situations, especially in the eastern of Ukraine. How do you deal with the fact that so much is damaged that the economy was already going less and less, where the relation with, with uh, Russia has been, uh, for trade reasons, also has been demolished for decades at least. You need to invent a new economy. And the knowledge about it is really limited. Well, I cannot say I'm pessimistic. I'm quite optimistic because the list fits on one page. So these, as we think, these are the strategic questions we can have with our team, with you, with many of uh, uh, the people in our network, we can build on these questions and try to be prepared as good as possible. And it's, it's interesting because many of those questions have been asked before in other countries, of course, and we try to inspire it. And it's not one way, it's not one way how to do it. Uh, and I hesitated to put in some of examples or nice pictures of good examples, but look at these pictures and these uh, examples as, uh, in a way, as to see them maybe, well, it's not so long ago that this happened also in Germany. It's not so long ago that this topic was also a, 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 a difficult topic in the Netherlands. It's actually quite inspiring to look at uh, Denmark because we can learn something from it. And uh, it's very uh, uh, interesting to see the Baltic states because they have a kind of similar history. So we could exchange more ideas. So it's not examples that I want to show as do it like this, do it like that. It's more like inspiration. And this is what we're trying to do within the Rosby team constantly as well. So the integrated design uh, and the integrated process uh, could be um, what we are doing now, this new structure vision in the Netherlands. This new structure vision is a huge um, uh, process of more than five years that has been developed and all these layers are integrated. And when you look at the left part, it's in Dutch, unfortunately, but when you look at the left part, you see what is happening underground, what's happening in the infrastructure, which is the second layer, and what's happening with what we call the occupation layer. So buildings, um, uh, agriculture, trees, nature, well, all, these, uh, all these layers are constantly interacting and you can use those different layers into quality. The Netherlands have uh, uh, just renewed uh, this, uh, this integrated design thinking. Uh, it was a huge discussion and a lot of experts have been thinking about, uh, about it. And we think, for example, that this could be one of the examples, not the only one, one of the examples where Ukraine could uh, make use of, that uh, could, be, um, it could be used. And this is also, in the right uh, a picture, something which you constantly make plans, your uh, structure plans, and then more detailed zoning plans, and then programs, and then you analyze it again. And also this process, which is around uh, around the circle. So you constantly go in this process from this to this. And this is also what you can literally uh, provide by laws or policies that you can have these processes aligned as a city. That every few years, every five years, you need to make a new structure plan then a zoning plan, then programs, and then within these five years, you have to analyze it again and come with a new one. So this is kind of a way of working, which we are having in the Netherlands. There's also a different look at what temporary or urgent could really mean. Uh, I've done myself quite a few of those projects in, uh, in, in different cities in the Netherlands uh, of, of urgent housing here in the left. 
which was needed in an abandoned building or an urgent temporary office in, in uh, with a, just a new simple facade and to make something more uh, fancy or an urgent temporary community building. So this is not only about those IDP housings and bringing in new modular homes. You can use it in different ways. You can be inspired by it to have it a little bit uh, more diverse, and maybe also more connected to the specific local question than, uh, um, than when you just bring in those modular uh, blocks. Um, I'm definitely, I will give a, another uh, lecture in the future about participation, uh, one of my specialisms. Uh, participation processes, um, which I, for example, did in Eindhoven about social housing. Um, to really design, to make decisions together with all the residents who were going to live in this to-be-built house or blocks. It took three to four years to do this. And at a certain moment, we made decisions with 150 different people in one room. But the energy that came out of it, and the pride uh, of the people who are living there now, it was amazing to see how it worked. And it was not like the, the, the happy few. This was just for the general Dutch people who just needed a house in a few years and wanted to help to build it. But we did the same also in Mariupol in 2015 to really get onto the street and ask what, uh, on a simple way, what good and bad things they experienced the most in, in Mariupol city at that moment. So to involve the citizens in those decisions and those discussions is very inspirational. <clears throat> There's many different ways to look at the inspiration of post-war, how to look at Dresden, Berlin, Rotterdam, they all did them differently. Um, uh, also in, in Syria, but I, would, um, I mean, it can main, name many countries, uh, um, uh, Bosnia, and most of those examples actually are filled with bad examples. Uh, please do not copy this process. But even that is interesting inspiration to learn from, to not step into the wrong direction. But this is something that we're also inspired by and looking for, discussing with different cities, what is the good relevant relation city we could learn from and dig into the deeper. <coughs> Sorry. And then there's um, post-industrial, industrial, not post-war, but post-industrial. Maybe some of the industry will stay, but definitely also some of the industry will not be rebuilt or not will not be reused. For example, Shevardonetsk before the war, the, the full-scale war, was already for 80 or 85 percent not used uh, factory territory. Um, but... Sorry, just a second. While Fulke is recovering, uh, I, I just have a personal request to you, Fulke. Please do talk a bit about the Eindhoven and X Philips uh, factory as one of the great examples of the post industrial thinking. I really love that Stripes district. <laughs> Stripes? Yeah. Yes. Well, it's, 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 go from right to left, maybe. It's interesting to see in, in Germany how the Ruhrgebiet, which was a huge, industrial area where in my childhood, everybody really didn't want to go because of the pollution in the air, because of the lack of comfort, because of the lack of public space. It was like really a, a no-go area if you didn't live and work there yourself. And this totally changed since the 90s. So I think 25, 30 years ago, when this industry collapsed and they had to think about new elements of uh, yeah, what to use with it, and how to use this area, and how to revive the uh, economy. And in, in Germany, they, they, they did many things, but one of them is to, to give these iconic buildings uh, and, and shafts and uh, factories to give them new identity in public sphere. So, culture, sports, uh, parks, uh, climbing walls, um, swimming pools. And that is what, how they used it. And uh, this became a new identity for this whole region. And actually, you saw that later in Eindhoven, uh, 
uh, things like that were copied. The middle uh, picture is a, a smaller uh, industrial place. Actually, it used to be my previous home in, in Eindhoven uh, and workspace. Uh, but the left is, is, is very interesting. It's uh, uh, an area which used to be Philips, like the, the uh, electronics uh, company. And uh, also that declined very much in the 90s. And then step by step, since 98, a public partnership organization between the city and one investor, they step by step developed this area into a new, very lively area with the use of all buildings and the impact of many new buildings and functions. And where it used to be a solitary uh, industrial area is now a mixed function of bars, restaurants, houses, um, offices, um, uh, sports facilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an example which I very often use when I'm in Eastern Ukraine, for example, in Zaporizhia, but also in Kriberich, to, yeah, to see how you can redevelop also the combination of economy and urban planning, and then take that into an advantage and, and a new identity. Um, I think this is the last slide, actually, um, or not. Um, oh no, here, here we go. Uh, last slide of inspiration, at least. There is um, uh, an, a, a roundup from my side. I think I already talked for 45 minutes. Good enough, uh, I hope. And let's, uh, let's try to find out together um, what are the possible steps. And yeah, well, uh, I just made a first uh, attempt to to have, to think about these possible steps. Um, what what do we know about urban planning uh, as in, as we can do it now? Um, and and all is good. I mean, we have to do research. We have to do analyzing. We have to analyze maps and data. We can make competitions for new ideas. Have a lot of debates within the city or region. Uh, education programs, uh, well, many things, like I said before, community projects, learn about local ecology. I don't know, it's, it's an endless list, but I just started uh, with these 10 uh, points. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to either ask a question to me or one of the other people in the audience, or think with me about what possible concrete steps we can take within the Roskvit or within the community around Thank Meaning so right much. now, without without waiting for the water in. Yes, please do use the QA button to put your questions. Or raise a hand. That's also great. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Hello, Folko. Uh, thank you for your um, presentation. I have one question regarding your strategy for incorporating the new- Nathan, can you, can you, can you interrupt? Can you, could you please turn on your camera? It's a little bit more nice for me and others to see it, <laughs> yeah, if it's you, possible. Are you Please. able to turn on the camera? In that case, I will promote you to panelist. Okay, okay. Um, Join us panelists. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Hey, do we see you not yet? So, yeah. You see me okay. now? Great. Let me now I can turn on my camera. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I was I had a, I had a question um, regarding uh, your strategy for engaging the new Ukrainian diaspora in uh, the discussion, because you have, of course, a large population that is not resident within Ukraine. And a lot of them are wanting to get engaged, but don't know how. And also from the perspective of um, urban planning, a lot of those, that population is now in other Eastern European um, uh, countries where they're, they're seeing different ways of adapting socialist cities to, um, to capitalist conditions. And so they might have interesting ideas on how uh, to contribute. So I was wondering if you have well, what your strategy is for basically polling or incorporating the new diaspora's views, those are not resident in Ukraine, so they can participate 
in the replanning and, and rebuilding of the country. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a start. Maybe other people from the audience have an answer as well, but uh, I'll make a start. Um, um, in the Netherlands, there was a small group of diaspora before last February. I mean, there was a group of uh, Ukrainians, of course, but not like a huge amount, maybe as it, it is in some other countries. So from my personal experience, there was not these, in, in so many urban planners or, or architects or related to, to this topic, people who could directly step in or, or were already in my network. Um, but I think um, uh, at this moment, we see um, uh, the connection between people who have been already in uh, the diaspora, so emigrants for five, ten, maybe longer years, uh, they connect more and more to the people who just have left the country in the last couple of months. And I think now the fact that this is getting into, unfortunately, in some kind of a stable situation, it could mean that this connection of the people who just left and who are really, really, in many cases, willing to do something and wanting to do something with Ukraine, this is very interesting. A example of some of our uh, Vosquit members, uh, uh, some of them, they left the country, came to me, whether they knew me or not, they came to me or to some of our uh, fellow members and said, okay, can I join Vosquit? Because that is the way how I keep connected to my country, not only through family and friends, but also by helping, even though I'm not there even though I'm not a soldier, even though I'm not evacuating people, but I'm still doing something for my country. So I think indeed diaspora, well, we didn't explore it fully, but diaspora is a very interesting group to, to make our organization more strong and, and our knowledge also. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question. From the audience, I can just say, is it necessary, in your opinion, to make changes to the legislate, current legislation of Ukraine to reduce construction time and improve quality, use new technologies and materials? Sorry, I didn't hear you well. Can you speak again? Yeah. Uh, is it necessary to make changes to legislation of Ukraine to reduce the construction time and improve quality, use new technologies and materials? at legislation level? Well, uh, um, uh, probably uh, there will be uh, some, some changes needed. What I understand, um, there, is a, uh, there is a problem with uh, some of the new technologies about certification. Um, to use, for example, um, circular concrete, and that means circular concrete means that you use concrete which has been used already, and then you need to reuse it, you, you, you crunch it and you reuse it. That means that uh, you have to have a certificate that proves that this concrete is really strong enough. Same counts for other materials, but the concrete. Um, this, uh, for not all materials, this is already being developed fast and well yet. And also some of the organizations who could do it are not functioning full 100%. So it's not real legislation that we need, but we, we, we do have to take into account, account that some of those procedures could take more time and can we think of processes that could speed it up uh, uh, more? Um, yeah, that's one of the things that we will, uh, that we'll be, we will need to develop. There is um, not about building materials, but about, um, uh, I think about, um, safety and about uh, sustainability, there will probably be uh, new regulations coming in. As, as I heard and what I understand that there will be new legal advisory or legal boundaries to, to build uh, in a safe way, also military wise in some areas and to build in a, a sustainable way in relation to uh, energy efficiency and energy independence. Great. Any other, Any other questions? questions? 
maybe you have some opinion you want to share or some idea it doesn't need to be a question to directly to focus it could just be a conversation started It's, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't, ah, yes, thank you, Katja. <laughs> How can we de de determine the needs of the city if the city is now occupied? Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a huge question that you're asking. Um, and uh, of course, one that is also difficult. Um, the example of Mariupol, how do we do this? Um, City Council of Mariupol defined before asking us to make a new strategy, they defined, um, we believe that we will be de-occupied, that, we'll be, we'll be, that we as Mariupol will be liberated again. We also know that there's a huge amount of damages, 60, 70, 90%, but huge. But we believe that people want to come back and people want to return to Mariupol, want to live in Mariupol. Uh, we even think of a strategy, even though we don't know how fast it will be, they will come back in maybe even bigger numbers than they were in 2021. That is like the, the general data. And we discussed with the city council and the deputy mayor, okay, let's keep this data as a as the basis. Uh, let's pretend this is really going to happen indeed and but we also have to be aware that it might not happen that it will be even bigger so we have to be able to have a good city strategy for different skills of the city for a scale of 100,000 200,000 but also 800,000 people depending on many issues we cannot we cannot think of yet we cannot uh, be prepared for but we can be prepared to, uh, to make a city strategy that Mariupol can grow until 200,000 people and a city strategy that it can grow bigger after that to 800,000 people. And then how can we determine the, 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 the needs itself, and not the data, but the needs itself? That's the constant discussion and debate first within our team, then uh, we, we do it with, a, with our design and research team, then we do it together. With, um, uh, with the city council, but th uh, on a third level, we are also doing this together with uh, citizens from Mariupol. And at this moment, we, we are planning to reach out to a peer group of citizens, not knowing exactly how many, but let's say 25, 30, 35, who will um, uh, give us feedback on some of our ideas. They give us feedback on the needs they uh, envision in Mariupol being present. Very special about this project in Mariupol is uh, that two of the team members just left uh, Mariupol uh, um, uh, just before, uh, uh, just just after the war started, or in, in the months after the war, war started, and they joined Oskvita as well. So we have a direct information, and I see one of the team members now raising his hand. Maybe Mikolai wants to answer something as well. Mikolai. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking about speaking about Mariupol as an occupied uh, city, presently uh, it is occupied, but we have open data, open source data. We understand what is ruined in Mariupol and what people need to return to carry on living in Mariupol, to work there and to live with their families. We understand that it must be a city of a new level because it is, it is not going to return to its old condition because the infrastructure is ruined, uh, jobs, there are no jobs there and we need to design a concept the, uh, for its development after the occupation, when people will start returning there for jobs, for, for living, and uh, before they start this 
we must have our strategy ready uh, so that the Ukrainian power could return to this city and make it livable for the residents and to meet the needs, uh, the needs in everything, in hospitals, in kindergartens, in uh, housing, in some social uh, objects, in parks, beaches, schools. So in terms of public transportation, so that people could get to their workplace and so these are the questions to be answered now so that we could be ready uh, when it happens. Thank you, uh, Nikolai, as well. Yes. Thank you, Mikola. Kasia, we hope we have answered your question. Um, uh, hand is raised, hand is okay. raised. So okay. let's, let's continue okay. with this. Yeah, no, report. awesome. <laughs> One sec, uh, I will just give her. Uh, Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. Hi, Katya. We can hear you well. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a proposition from my side regarding the returning of people and their needs. Uh, I think that it's necessary to return or to develop several strategies. Uh, for, for example, for Mariupol, um, short, uh, medium and long term strategy, as well as positive scenario, negative scenario, and neutral scenario for the development of the city uh, and um, for the needs of the inhabitants after the their occupation. The last word I missed for the needs of what? Uh, for the needs of the inhabitants. Yeah. Yes, I, I think your uh, your suggestion is really smart to have these different length of uh, uh, after the war, as short term, mid term, long term. Um, uh, it's also interesting to think about a strategy of uh, a negative strategy, as you say. It's not only the optimistic part, but also what happens if some things go uh, less uh, uh, less than expected. And um, yeah, that could be uh, could be interesting for our team to take into account. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you. Meanwhile, we have a few questions. Um, yeah, I will. Try. So, Folka, thank you for the lecture. Can you tell us what effect Roskrit team work has on similar projects being developed by other teams in Ukraine? Mm, uh, well, yes, uh, hopefully a lot. I mean, we don't do it for ourselves. We, we try to be a network. We already work together with some of the other teams and they are part of the network, uh, like the Kohati project or like a new housing policy uh, team. Um, but um, uh, I think a, a lot of more relations could be established. Um, I think... Um, it goes also the other way around. Uh, some of the other projects also could help us to make our methodologies and strategies more valuable and more uh, specific or more uh, better quality. So if we know uh, either in urban planning or in architecture or in uh, energy mobility, if we know other project projects going on and we can exchange uh, the lessons that come out of that, I would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, there are two more questions. I will say both of them are about Mariupol. You answered part of them, but maybe it's good to repeat it again. So in your opinion, what makes more sense to restore the current planning of destroyed districts of Mariupol or to plan from from scratch i wish i knew the answer already uh, literally this morning we had this discussion again because it's constantly going back and forth what is uh, needs to be done there's many arguments to to rebuild according at least to the structure of the city because of the infrastructure which is there still somehow because of the memory people relate to a place they can go back there they can find it 
uh, some of the buildings uh, are the old buildings, some of them are new, some of them have a memory of the old building. So you can really think it would be very good to, to, to start from, from that point, uh, how it used to be. But there were also quite a lot of problems in, in Mariupol before uh, February 22. So what can we do at this moment? Can we use this moment also to solve these problems for once and for, for all? And then there's a conflict uh, between the different strategies, because then you're making something new, then you're maybe changing areas in, in, uh, in, into another function. What does it mean for ownership? It's it's um, what, what does it mean in technical use? It's it's many different questions, and I think at this moment we are yeah you know, we are not ready to answer it fully. But I think what we are heading to is like a combination of those two. So in some parts we really make we probably will make radical decisions. We're not going to rebuild Azov style factory. At least we're not going to advise to rebuild Azov style factory as it was because it was just a polluted area. And it has many negative memories. Uh, if something should be done with this memory. People should be able to visit that. And I mean, it was also a closed area. So there's a lot of reasons why you should rethink as of style factory. But in other areas, mainly residential areas, it's maybe a little bit more nuanced and maybe a little bit more complex also. And uh, we are now looking more deep into the maps and into the to the to the structure of the city where it should be a radical change, where it could be a slight change, where it could be back to history, and also that in time. So maybe we start in a few areas to do something that really relates to the place it was before, but only temporary, and then step by step, we change it into something um, uh, more future-proof, future-proof in relation to uh, economy, safety, uh, nature, climate, etc. I hope that gives a, enough answer. Uh, and also, I hope I didn't give away too much because we didn't discuss this yet with the city council. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's one more question that yeah, I found quite interesting. What should we do to the buildings that are currently now being built by the Russians? Can I ask this question back? What, what what do you think we should do with it? Because it's it's a very good question, but I really have not. It it, I, it was not in my priority for now <laughs> to think about it, and I didn't really have the, the strategy for it. But but I'm really interested in your own thoughts. Um, Could you write or put in a microphone? Yeah, I see that me. Katya has mentioned that it, it might depend on the cost of reconstruction, yeah, as well as the reputational risks of a single building. Yeah, but that's not related to the Russian, the new Russian buildings uh, that they are building. Oh, yeah. OK. If Katerina wants to speak up. Yeah. Go ahead, Katerina. Um, unmute yourself. It's, I, I, I just want to clear, it's related to the uh, Ukrainian uh, buildings mm. and the buildings okay. uh, in Sorry. the that war before the uh, Russian occupation. Yeah. It's uh, my comment for, for these buildings. Yeah. But who, is there anybody in the audience that has something to say about the Russian buildings and how to treat them or... Well, then we just put it on the agenda for ourselves and uh, yeah. I'll come back with an answer later. I'm not going to improvise. Yes, please. There is. Yes, Edbatas. Please unmute yourself. Uh, а, почему меня этот вопрос интересует? Я жил на, на окраине Мариуполя, и, а, и данные кварталы сейчас строятся непосредственно против моего дома, условно. Поскольку они сейчас занимают пустые территории, которые планировались под, допустим, а, 
на этих территориях город планировал построить медицинский кампус, а также э, спортивную арену. И сейчас эта территория занята. Вот поэтому, поскольку эти здания лег, э, были э, легко построены, скорее всего, без фундамента, без какой-то э, подготовки, то есть они были построены за несколько месяцев. Поэтому имеет ли смысл данные конструкции демонтировать для того, чтобы использовать те планы, которые были у города до оккупации? So my question would be: uh, uh, this uh, I I am in the. Uh, so, uh, excuse me, please, uh, Fulco, the situation is that Albertas lives opposite the place where these uh, new districts are constructed and they popped up during the several months of the occupation. Mm -hmm. So should they be dismantled? Because this area was planned by Mariupol pre-war, before the war, uh, for a hospital and a sports arena. That is why he was asking the question. Yeah, I, I know, I know it was me meant for this and... Uh... I'd, I'd love to get into a discussion with him uh, um, maybe now but maybe later uh, so I I think dismantling a building which is there which costs a lot of money it also is useless but I think the negative memory on this building could be too much but it's maybe what, what, what is your feeling about this Alberta? should we advise to dismantle In my opinion, these objects are um, at the entry of the city. So the first thing you see are these objects built by the occupants. And so it changes the whole uh, concept of the city when you enter the city and you see this, and it changes the panorama of the city. So actually, you know Mariupol, and so it's right after the cellar. Mm -hmm. And so you enter Mariupol, and right after the Stella, you see this new development. So. Okay, um, I, I I I hear your yeah your suggestion to to not leave it there, and um, I can imagine that I can imagine you, that is not the way you want to enter your city. It is not the way which should be the first look uh, of your city. Uh, uh, um thank you for your uh, advice. Katja, Katerina. Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that first of all, uh, we should, uh, I, I agree with uh, Albatros, but I, I think that first of all, uh, we have to uh, do the outbeat of these buildings. Uh, and uh, I think it was, uh, was it will be very useful to make a museum of the occupation of uh, the city, for example, of the Mariupol there, and uh, change the facades of these buildings. Um, for example, it's my it's my thoughts about this. Thank you, thank you, Katrina. There was one question that Gala Gronienko has posted. The question is, can, can you use analogy about monuments confederacy in the USA? And Nathan wanted to respond to that live. So Nathan, please. Thank, thank you, Gala. That's a very interesting point. I'm, I'm in Texas, so I'm in the part of the United States that used to be part of the confederacy. And we have on my, I'm a teacher there, and I'm, uh, on my campus, we are always having these discussions about Confederate monuments and the, the, the arguments back and forth. Do you preserve, uh, even if it's a history that you're not proud of, or do you tear down? What's the risk of tearing down monuments versus not? And so, you know, you could, in a sense, class the preservation of certain destroyed structures in the same category as the attempts to rebuild certain structures or the attempts to place 
new monuments uh, or the, the, the even the billboards or things like that that have been placed by the occupying forces as a way to sort of show their intended the intended permanence of the occupation um, and, or recolonization. So that that's a very I just wanted to say that that's a very interesting way of looking at it the analogy to the Confederate monuments in the United States. Um, that 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 discussion is very difficult to have, um, and so, um, but it's an interesting point. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. It's, uh, it's also interesting that the, I was at a meeting this afternoon with um, uh, many different people in the Netherlands who are doing something about. Uh, uh, humanitarian aid and, and uh, in, in Ukraine at this moment and refugee help and healthcare and, and then I was introduced as the one who was more like the one who's uh, about hardware about the buildings and when I hear this discussion I so much know that yeah the buildings is yeah it's indeed the topic that we're talking about but those buildings have a lot of feelings and um, this is um uh, it's more and more on, on our own agenda how to deal with that and how and it's also feelings that you have to it's not only what is the final solution but it's also the process of, of dealing with those feelings and to discussing those feelings and I think the questions that have been asked uh, now about uh, USA and then about Russian uh, uh, buildings uh, just being erupted they really yeah give me back this this feeling of um, that's what it's all about, to, to, to debate, to discuss, to find meaning uh, for, for the city again. It's, it's, it's very nice. And also to give people time to digest. Yeah, so in between those debates, in between those discussions. Yeah, it, it also brings me to the, to the idea with this thinking out loud that, that how we are now working as a team. Of course, in the beginning, you need to work a little bit introvert and you need to, to think about yeah, with, with not too many distraction. And it's very difficult to do it publicly, but yeah, we should try to be much more open uh, even to, to not, not to know all the answers, but to, to, to find the questions and to find possible arguments and, and solutions together and uh, I'm not sure exactly how, but uh, well, maybe this relates to my my next lecture of participation. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it might it might be a, an extra topic or, or a chapter. Thank you for the spoiler alert, Fulco. So the next <laughs> the next lecture <laughs> will be not not in two weeks. Somebody <laughs> okay, uh, okay, sometime later. Uh, Katarina, you st you have one more question. I have I see your hand raised. No, no, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Team, we have yeah. two minutes left before the officially the webinar is closed. Any other questions, suggestions, words of gratitude to Fulco? Yeah. Well, Fulco, then let me tell you great thank you for this wonderful hour and a half. Uh, immense, I would say lots of topic raised. Um, lots of interesting, like not lots, but all the questions that were asked are for us to think of for sure within project teams. So thank you audience for, for the active participation. Thank you for joining. If you want to revisit this lecture, it will be available on YouTube channel starting as of tomorrow. Um, also, yeah, please do follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, if you're not following yet. Uh, we are planning to come back to buy bi-weekly uh, lecture series. So stay tuned for the, for the new ones. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, goodbye.